Hi, and welcome. I'm Mary Woolley, the President and CEO of Research America. Welcome to our 2020 National Health Research Forum. Our theme for this three-day event is securing a science-strong future. And that means securing the future, your future, my future, the future of our nation and the world we live in. COVID-19 is sounding many alarms right now, but none of them more piercingly loud than the need to build on and build out our nation's R&D strengths. There'll be so much more on that theme in the hours and days ahead. As we get started today, I wanna to draw your attention to the slide on the screen listing the more than 30 federal officials and members of Congress, both current and former, who are participating in the forum. Thank you so very much for your service and for spending time with us. I also wanna thank our sponsors of the event. First, with a big thank you to Pfizer as our lead sponsor. You're great as our partner of longstanding. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Takeda Pharmaceutical Company for hosting this first day of program. Thank you for helping us kick off the forum with terrific speakers, panels, and special features. And I'd like to thank our panel sponsors, Advamed, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Elsevier, GlaxoSmithKline, Johnson & Johnson, Pharma, Regeneron, Sanofi, and UCB. And thanks to our Fireside Chat sponsors, Bio and Picori, our Advocacy and Action sponsor, Eli Lilly and Company, our Flash Talks competition sponsor, Asai, and our 20 Voices, 3 Minutes, 1 Question sponsors, the American Society for Microbiology, the Association of Clinical Research Organizations, Amgen, Colgate, and the Medical Device Manufacturers Association. Thank you all for making this special three-day event possible. Now, before we go any further, I want to offer a few cues for navigating the forum platform. All sessions are accessed through the auditorium. Also in the auditorium, you will find a list of upcoming sessions and at the beginning of the next day, recordings from the previous day's sessions. You can navigate to the various forum features using the navigation bar at the top of the page. Please make the info desk for technical support. And with that, I want to introduce you to our MCs for today, Derek Rapp and Donna McKelvey. Derek, over to you first. Thanks, Mary. And uh, before we get started, I, uh, I want to say on behalf of this entire community, a, a big thank you to you both for your leadership of Research America and also for your tireless championing of research overall. Uh, you are making a tremendous difference in this entire community and in the world. And so we really, really thank you so much for that. So indeed, hi folks, I'm Derek Rapp. I'm a managing director at Riverfest Venture Partners a venture capital firm focusing on life sciences. And uh, co-hosting with me today will be Donna McKelvey. Donna is the Vice President of, sorry, uh, Alliance Development and Membership for Research America. Hi, Donna. Good morning, Derek, and thanks so much. Uh, for more than 20 years, Research America has hosted the National Health Research Forum during the first week of September. And historically, it's been a day-long event right here in Washington, D.C. This year, like many other events in 2020, the forum has a completely different format. Throughout the next three days, you'll hear conversations with such prominent leaders as the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, Congresswoman Diana DeGette, and Congressman Fred Upton, NIH Director Dr. Francis Collins, CDC Director, Dr. Robert Redfield. Admiral Brett Gerard, Assistant Secretary for Health at the Department of Health and Human Services. And NIAID Director, Dr. Anthony Fauci. The forum also features panel discussions on topics that are front and center as our nation 
and the global community fight and learn from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as those focused on research and public health relevant threats that are longstanding. And throughout the forum, a diversity of leaders from Congress, the executive branch, and across the public-private R&D ecosystem will share insights with us in a mode of cameo performances. It's a new feature for the forum, so we please, please do let us know what you think. Derek, back to you. And we'll also hear from powerful patient advocates and view a Flash Talks competition during which early career researchers both from industry and academia, will fill us in on their work, show off their communication skills, and probably teach us a thing or two about how to effectively advocate. So please note that throughout the forum, you can learn more about the amazing panelists that we have for all three days, lined up uh, and review the forum agenda in the virtual auditorium. Just click on their names to read their amazing bios. Donna? Great. Thanks, Derek. So let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce our first session, Elections 2020 with Steve Clemens. Welcome, Steve. Welcome. Good to see you. Great. Uh, great, great to be with you. So I love Research America. I, I enjoyed so much being there last year. Um, and it just seems like everything has gotten uh, to the point where Research America is needed even more. So I'm, I'm sharing a little bit of my bias here. But I do want to start something. I always start with a little prop. So I'm going to use this prop. I'm going to credit Jonathan Allen of NBC News, who showed my ignorance about a great cultural uh, uh, moment here. And so let me just play it here. Hopefully you can hear it. So that is Galileo by Indigo Girls, because I had been on a show with him uh, and said, you know, not, I can't think of a time where America has been on the edge and the world has been on the edge of so many astounding technological leap and possibilities. Uh, and I learned this from Research America. But yet, if Galileo were somehow resurrected today, I sometimes wonder if he'd be found guilty again. Uh, and so we have a tension in the moment in our politics. Uh, and attention in our science. And I wanted to give a very quick snapshot and encourage those of you who want to pose questions to do so in the chat room. They're going to be read to me. We've got, a, uh, we've got enough time uh, to give you a snapshot of the political terrain in the country, uh, hopefully without bias, but I you know, want to uh, be very realistic about the tensions. And, and because uh, other people's views are worth more than my own, I wanted to give a bit of a positive note because the Hill just recently had a, a major forum about science and, and advancing America. And in that forum, I had the privilege of interviewing three people. Let me just read three significant voices, Republican and Democrat, uh, and lines that they share that I think are re relevant today. Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson, who, uh, who of course chairs the House Science Committee, says scientific breakthroughs just don't come overnight. If they're going to come with credibility, the time, the effort, the dollars must be invested. And I want to underscore that credibility thing. Pfizer, who's an un underwriter today, they didn't pay me to say this, is one of those firms that just today announced that they and a leading set uh, uh, of other firms in the biopharmaceutical research area around coronavirus won't take shortcuts and are pledging themselves to that. So credibility important. Now I interviewed Representative Mikey Sherrill, Democrat of New Jersey, who's on the same committee. She says, I'm in New Jersey and we had Bell Labs, which really, uh, brought people together from all different backgrounds, metallurgists, engineers, physicists, chemists. We had so many fantastic inventions and seven Nobel Prizes. That's how you get great science, bringing so many disciplines together and funding great innovation. The siloing of how different disparate parts get funded, that doesn't lead to the great overarching inventions that this country is capable of. And another checkbox, uh, I think, in the corner of Research America. And then finally, Representative Trey Hollingsworth, a Republican from Indiana, he says, we are the technological leaders around the world, but that is not a matter of destiny. It is a matter of our choices every single day. Will we continue to do the right things to foster more innovation in this country versus elsewhere? As I've said over and over again, it starts with education. Talent and erudition are going to be the key ingredients to technological advancement in the 21st century, and on and on. And so this was the flavor of that moment. And I wanted to lay that context that Republicans and Democrats, we also had Paul DeBar, the Undersecretary of uh, Energy for Science. And so it didn't look, you found a constituency that I think would agree with, the, with, with Mary Woolley about everything. But let's go through and have a quick um, survey of what the, the, uh, the political scene in the country is. First of all, 
when you kind of delve in, and I've gone into the Pew uh, research uh, uh, polls that many of you know, whether it's on vaccinations or on climate science or lately 5G, which has become controversial, there is an overwhelming, there's a majority of support in the nation uh, uh, for all of those advancements, vaccination advancements, climate science, 5G, uh, and you see the support in those areas among those who have you know, graduate experience, postgraduate, have, have some college. It's where you get into the some college uh, and, and uh, high school or less that you see support or the expectations massively drop off. Uh, and income matters as well. As you get lower income, uh, you have less trust in those advancements that come up. I think it's important because it will get to a little bit about some of the current political divisions in the country and the lack of trust between two sides. Um, that's there. But most Americans overwhelmingly um, see net positive uh, impact from science. Um, I think, though, we run a risk if we keep talking about the majority of Americans, because this is a time where, the, where any minority well organized and with a good Twitter feed uh, can be disruptive and, and challenge uh, what the majority might think. Um, 49 percent I'm sorry, 44% have confidence in leaders in the scientific community, and that's been stable since the 1970s. Uh, and you look at whether it's the Edelman Trust Barometer, the Pew studies, or other studies are out there. Um, at this moment, science, those particularly in the medical science, but science with, you know, science authorities, they are going up in this time of crisis and pandemic today uh, as authorities that people look to, and that's a good thing. The military is also high. Um, I should note that the press is at 13%. So maybe that's a problem for Research America and starting with people in the media is not the right thing to do, but we'll put a hold on that for a moment. Um, but medical scientists, journalists, elected officials, uh, thank goodness, are lower uh, in, in reputation and trust than media. So I'm a little bit better than they are. Um, there are, uh, 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 when you look at the national poll right now between Biden and Trump, you know nationally, and we, 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 this, I won't spend a lot of time on this because the, the, the numbers are, are nearly omnipresent, but uh, Joe Biden leads Donald Trump right now by about seven points nationally, and that's you know, even aggregating all of the polls that are out there. Um, likely independent voters, um, however, in, in, I, I shouldn't say likely independent voters, but in the poll that we're close to at the Hill, the Harvard-Harris poll, of those that wouldn't call them independent, but they did not indicate a preference between Biden and Trump, at this moment, 58% of those favor Donald Trump over Joe Biden. So there is tension out there and that anyone that thinks this is a slam dunk uh, for Joe Biden, given some of the buildup that he has had, uh, I think we would be mistaken. Uh, when you add those numbers in that tilt, Joe Biden is really at just a 6% lead nationally. When you get into uh, uh, some of the battleground states like Pennsylvania, his lead has shrunk from 7% to about 4%. And that's consistent in the Wisconsin's and, and in many uh, of the battleground states in the country where there's been a big narrowing. Um, and it looks very, very much, uh, if you will, like what was the case when Donald Trump was faced off with Hillary Clinton. He trailed by roughly those numbers back then. Um, so we'll have to see whether there is a uh, replay of this. Uh, President Trump is underperforming uh, with seniors and suburban women when compared to Donald Trump. And recently, The Hill ran a, an interesting piece by Nancy Lamond of AARP um, about the most powerful voter in America today is the woman over 50 years old, and that neither party is really going out and systematically talking to those communities. They have a millennial or a younger generation uh, tilt, but it is women over 50 who, will, who, say, who, who say they're going to vote, and then they do vote, uh, and have uh, uh, a lot of sway in this. And both, um, according to research I've seen, feel a bit neglected uh, by political leaders and political parties today. In the uh, recent um, uh, Harvard-Harris poll, uh, Joe Biden um, overwhelmingly was, was seen by people by 69% as the candidate who would bring us together. Uh, uh, Donald Trump was seen overwhelmingly by those by about 56% uh, uh, as the man who would fix the economy. So that shows you one, a, a unity candidate. Let's, let's you know, deal with all the details later, uh, Donald Trump on, on fixing the economy. One of the things that I sure will not be a surprise for this audience is that overwhelmingly the coronavirus, um, the impressions of how uh, the White House has managed that 
the pandemic and all of the corollary pieces, whether it's schools and education, whether it's you know dealing with China, uh, all of that side, or or as I just mentioned with regard to Pfizer's uh, steps, the question of are we politicizing the the uh, science channel uh, is something of great concern, and that is the biggest thing uh, that has cost Donald Trump support. And I should add there because I'm reading numbers that are just very fresh. But if you go back to, and I don't mean to be, be you know tongue in cheek, but you know he said it. Uh, but if you go back to Lysol Day or Clorox Day or the day of disinfectants, Donald Trump was running at above 60 percent, 60 percent plus. Uh, among most Americans and giving given credit for how he was managing the coronavirus at that point. Many people neglect that. It wasn't until the moment when the coronavirus um, uh, task force briefings were suspended when he talked about both the uh, internal lights and potential uh, internal ingestion of, or injection of disinfectants did his support fall. You go back to that moment to that day uh, and you see that the coronavirus has overwhelmed everything else that I'm talking about uh, in terms of those issues. His, um, that said, uh, Trump's job approval has increased over the last month to 46% from 43%, 54% of the people disapprove. Um, but 57% of the voters say Biden is preferred to lead um, out of the coronavirus. That, those are the issues when it comes to the current pandemic and, and uh, how people are looking I think at the question of the management of the science uh, ecosystem, as I would I would put it, and you see this interesting action of private sector players, scientists, leagues of scientists, saying that uh, whether it's the hydroxychloroquine direction that we went through, or or talking about uh, now, I think the interesting question is, you know, there's there there is there is a there is a substantive and real possibility that a credible vaccine could be identified before the election, but I think that would seem so political. That people would have a hard time doing it. So when you know when you kind of get into that level and you try to measure trust in the science outcomes, I think it's challenged by these political behaviors right now, and you see that in the numbers. Um, there are, of course, many other issues to talk about. Right now, the second biggest issue, or the other big issue right now beyond the coronavirus, uh, are the George Floyd-related uh, protests, police brutality, the question of law and order, um, and the question of really what is our social contract and how do we both have dignity uh, for every race and every participant, uh, and then how the police uh, behave and do this. Uh, and what's interesting is that Joe Biden right now um, wins on both those counts. He is uh, uh, right now 58% of the nation sees Biden uh, as the better choice in managing violence and civil unrest. 59% see him both better on race and policing. And then when you look at the American public, while one is higher, 61% of the public support policemen and police police, you know, in, in the way, but also 53% also support and identify with the Black Lives Matter movement. And so they they carry around uh, both of these things. They want law and order. Uh, they want to have racial dignity uh, uh, as part of the equation. Um, one of the other interesting components uh, that I'll just throw out there is that three quarters of the nation is worried about crime. Uh, uh, they see this as 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 rising and a big problem out there. And I think that will, and the reason I raise this is that when you get into crime, you look at um, also the question of the economy and what the social contract may be or the expectations of people out there. One of the questions that I've often had and I tried to make part of our science forum recently is what is going to be the national investment and the national priority of the science uh, community in all of its form, not just the health science, but uh, uh, those things that are not you know, going to space, uh, the National Science Foundation activities, et cetera. It has to compete with these other uh, priorities that people have. And right now, top of mind for them are uh, the violence issues, the race issues, the community uh, tumult that we see around the nation. Um, what's interesting is Donald Trump's uh, largest uh, uh, strength is in uh, jobs in the economy. 53% of the Americans trust him uh, more than uh, 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 Joe Biden. And you look at the numbers where we were at a higher 14.7% unemployment, that's now been brought down to 8.4% unemployment. Lots of people are trying to qualify what that means. But to Americans, it looks like progress. To American, many Americans, it gives Donald Trump an edge on that economy front that Joe Biden has not yet. That said, 42% fear a recession ahead. And again, 
recessions and what you'll do with them and what kinds of investments you make, if that's the fear people have, that sometimes puts pressure on the kind of investment dollars that are important. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, basically do a quick, uh, 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 I, we can go into this in, in, in questions, but right now, if you look at uh, sources like the Cook Political Report, um, you know, which I think is one of the best barometers on how the House and Senate are going to turn out. The House looks so solidly in Democratic camp that it's um, hard to do it. It doesn't look like the Republicans have a pathway uh, back there should they do well. Um, what, what's interesting is, is the Senate in which uh, Republicans have twice the number of seats up this time than Democrats do. Uh, and there are a lot of toss up races. And so one of the, the interesting questions when you look around the country to sort of look at COVID uh, is that the governors in the, each of these states in which these folks are are generally much more popular than the senators or house members from their state uh, related to COVID and coronavirus. And, and uh, you've got folks like, you know, Colorado, Maine, uh, Montana, North Carolina, uh, some states that you would never have thought were uh, 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 in danger of shifting and uh, Arizona uh, and lots of these look um, uh, unstable for um, uh, the Republicans right now. And so you could very well see, um, I think, a loss of the Senate. It, I would not have said this two months ago, but today I would say it's looking like, in, from my perspective, a tilt of the Senate uh, towards the Democratic side, which raises interesting, interesting prospects, which I'd be happy uh, to get. There are other big issues out there that I think are relevant to the science community uh, and the research community, and that's what's going on on the international front. And you know, I, I, I won't pussyfoot around it. I think that the, that the global uh, system of trust that's required for high quality exchange and collaboration in science um, is, is threatened. And I think that, I hope that comes up in discussion today because all of your companies, all of your research facilities, all of your labs depend on a certain degree of flow of talent, exchange of talent, the contribution of research to a global commons uh, and that is supposed to be a high trust environment. And whether you're looking at potential rising uh, uh, challenges like China uh, today, but China is also a major investment in PhDs uh, who are out there on the front edge of their own scientific community. Uh, they are uh, 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 important as is Europe. But when you look at the kind of broad level of trust, I think trust, we, we are now seeing a highly interconnected world where walls are back and trust is low. And the question is, can science thrive and continue in that environment? One of the people I had on from uh, uh, formerly with AAAS, but he's now with the National Academies of Science, Von Tarekian, uh, was a science advisor to the Secretary of State. And he had this keen insight years ago about how science could be a door opener to the most thuggish regimes in the world, whether it was Cuba, North Korea, whatever, that you could get in the door and then begin trying to communicate in ways that you wouldn't other. Today, science has become more politicized uh, and the lines and demarcations uh, uh, higher, you know, where we are seeing policymakers in Washington say China may not participate uh, in, in certain collaborations anymore. And, and I just have to, 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 to raise the question, not make the, 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 the decision or assertion that that will be bad, but it raises a question that this is not the way we have seen science evolve and that science ecosystem before. So trade, China, international engagements, and the health of our alliances, even with allies. And part of this is going to come in, which I'm sure will come up in the discussion today about global supply chains and the national shock that many people felt when PPE was not in ready supply and you had um, this worry that there were key elements, both in drugs and pharmaceuticals, but also uh, in basically supplies and protective gear uh, that America didn't make and that was dependent on other nations uh, and dependent on other nations that we've kind of been throwing darts at. And so I think part of that is going to also be part of the political terrain, not overwhelmingly, but it is there and it affects you know, your research community and your investment community. I think you're going to see pressure to come back. But as Senator Chris Coons and others have said, we need to, uh, former Senator Bill Frist, former Senate Majority Leader, told me recently, we need to begin to study you know, what our national strategic reserve looks like, what goes into it, and do an annual assessment of what the United States may need to do. Maybe that will be a helpful uh, corrective to some of that, but I would not underestimate uh, uh, something that I think is still brewing in America, 
then I'm going to you know, end on this and go to your questions. But there was brewing in America and that was brewing before when Donald Trump uh, 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 came in ahead of Hillary Clinton. Um, and that is a sense that global engagement has not yielded the returns back to the United States that it normally does. I um, joined 23andMe, the, the, the DNA, um, uh, I can tell you all kind of the proclivities your body may have or whatever, but it can also connect you uh, with, you know, with emails of um, cousins you didn't know you had. I mean, hundreds of them. So I've tried to find before that election about 100 cousins of mine that did not know that were blood relatives, not knowing necessarily where they were from, but figured they were from Kentucky, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, most of them, which they are. And so I did a poll back then of about who was supporting Donald Trump, who was supporting Hillary Clinton, and then I would go on MSNBC and share that, that data. And at that time, my, my blood relatives were overwhelmingly military families, overwhelmingly uh, from red states, and 90% of the 100 that I had identified and targeted began these conversations with supported President Trump. I recently did this in anticipation of today, went back to check with most that would get in touch with me. I added a couple more, and that number is now at 75% for Donald Trump. Now, that may not sound a lot, but a 15-point drop in the sort of Clemens scale, if you will, is an interesting indicator that people are hearing and seeing things that were potentially um, uh, disturbing. And I'm not saying that as a point, it's a measure of change and shift. We often talk about is Donald Trump's base solid? Uh, this is showing me that there may be a couple of cracks in there. It's still overwhelmingly uh, for Trump among the people I'm related to in these areas. But it raised this interesting question of international system because my, when you talk to them, for them, they, this, this thing we used to joke about, in the Northeast and privileged schools, you know, America fought the uh, Cold War and China won, is a very real thing for them, that they feel that they lost their jobs in the 0809 crisis, uh, they lost their homes in that, in that financial crisis, they blame the sort of New York community, and they see, and this is the one uh, uh, fear I have about the science community, is science sometimes, and, and the rarefied nature of how it works and the degree uh, of, of excellence and expertise that, that, that is part of that may in fact seem pretty metaphorically similar to high finance. And I think that's one of the big things. Joe Biden told me in 2016 that the Democrats had become a party of snobs and we're gonna have to fix that. We don't know whether he's fixed that or not, but I do know that a lot of Americans felt demeaned and left behind. And so when you look at the, the questions, when you poll them and you look at this question measuring their respect or not of expertise, they simultaneously respect science and science authorities while at the same time having a kind of disdain or feeling like they, uh, many folks feel demeaned or left behind. I think that is the tension uh, there. There are lots of other issues we could get into that are hot uh, topics like schools, guns, you know, where is children and children anxiety uh, at this moment, which are big drivers of the political thing. But I will leave the, uh, the rest to your coalition, uh, to your questions, uh, and hopefully end right here on time and say, Go listen to uh, Galileo and Indigo Girls, which I didn't even know what Indigo Girls was. Uh, uh, I was that kind of um, uncultured nerd. But um, I do think it's interesting that when you go to Susan Hockfield's book uh, for a minute, Susan, of course, is the president emerita of MIT. I interviewed her the other day, and I know she, she will be on later in the program, where she talks about virus-built batteries and protein-based water filters and cancer-detecting nanoparticles and, and nanotechs powering cars and uh, on, on a computer engineered crops. When you look at those things and that, and, and you know, in her book, Living Machines, which I highly recommend to everyone, um, you realize, and I asked her, I said, do you feel that future that you sort of identifying of the possibility, the convergence of science is threatened? And she said, yes, there's a noose around that, that network that we have to be aware of and that we have to look at the debates going on and we have to sort of make sure that we are investing uh, uh, at the level that we need to. My sense, looking at the poll numbers, is not Americans understand that equation yet. And that's, I think, the challenge for Research America and why Mary Woolley and her team are there. So why don't I stop there and we'll, we'll go with whatever questions we have. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. This is Caitlin Briskoviak with Research America. I'm going to go ahead and read your questions. If you want to type anything, you can go ahead and put it in the Q&A, and I'm going to go ahead and get started with what we have so far. Uh, our first question is, um, what is the possibility and ramifications of Trump supporters voting in person while Biden supporters, supporters voting by mail, which would result in a Trump winning on election night and Biden declared the winner weeks later? 
Um, I think, well, look, I, uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you for that uh, question. Look, I don't know how the voters are all gonna vote. My sense is that this is gonna be one of the most uh, 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 actively, uh, one of the largest elections in American history. And I think everyone will vote every which way. Um, I think Kevin McCarthy has been, uh, uh, the Republican leader in the House has been worried uh, that Donald Trump signals to uh, Republican voters, particularly elderly Republican voters, is that they abstain or don't uh, uh, go vote in person, given um, his resistance on mail-in voting. I don't buy that. I think that that at an individual level, those people who are very committed to voting will find it. So that said, but your other point of your question, um, I think is, is, is really important. I think there is a uh, a fear out there, and I think we have to simulate all potential possibilities of what may happen, is that either of the candidates, let me just be completely objectively distant, either of the candidates could declare victory. You know, Joe Biden could. I mean, people are saying, well, Donald Trump, given some of the steam they would uh, have heard from his, would declare victory and then would be undermined uh, later by vote counts. Yeah, that could happen. But it could also happen the other way, where, where the, the seeming uh, 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 overwhelming, uh, an overwhelming turnout and a landslide for Joe Biden uh, might in fact be less too. So I just want to keep open the fact that, that, that they're there. But, but to, to, to your point, Mike Bloomberg has come out uh, and he's been the one most actively promulgating this notion that, that uh, uh, Donald Trump could declare win a victory that night and then uh, have Joe Biden uh, doing this. So it could happen, we'll see, um, but a lot of things could happen. I'll tell you one thing I think is that once there are 270 certified electoral college votes, no matter where they go, whether they go for Donald Trump or Joe Biden, I don't believe that the other candidate has a fight. Even if President Trump does not want to accept the results or Joe Biden doesn't want to accept those, but let's just say President Trump, I don't believe uh, from the Republicans I know, particularly in the United States Senate, that they will, um, I, I don't believe they will stand with the certified loser uh, in that race. Thanks, Steve. Um, okay, so we have time for one more question. And so we're sure. going to go with, um, how concerned are you and the people you've polled about the prospect of the FDA and its decisions being politicized? I think it's highly, I, you know, we live in a time where, look, I mean, I, um, how do I put this? We've done through this before. Like, I mean, many of you may be health experts and you can uh, uh, email me about, you know, how eggs and cholesterol or whether they're dangerous or not. You know, that's been the back and forth where, where, you know, health experts have gone back. Well, we're back in this moment, but we're in a very fast period of time. The FDA and other authorities like the CDC with its school guidance, the FDA on the question of con convalescent plasmids, uh, the FDA with the question of you know, what it would do to, to go out there. And then seeing folks like Stephen Hahn and others, I don't know if Stephen is, I have a lot of respect for Stephen, but they are basically in a situation where they are trying not to offend the guy at the, at the top while they're also trying to communicate uh, expertise and scientifically based and grounded knowledge to the American public. And, and I think as you see these flip-flops, um, and I'm just gonna call him out right now, he's not speaking today, I'd love to interview him, but Peter Navarro, when he goes out and said, hey, we need to be on Trump speed and not on scientific speed, or we don't, you know, looking at this as being different, has injected this idea that whatever we come out with may be suspect. And my fear is today that we could come out with an FDA approved uh, and, and, and certified vaccine or set of vaccines that come out that are driven by a political calendar, and they may be perfectly fine in what America needs, but there's going to be a chunk of Americans that don't trust it because of the calendar. Whether, I think, I think Trump and company would like to have that out because they see that as a net benefit to their campaign. I think a lot of other people are gonna be, this is what's dividing America right now, is the sense that science is not getting the time, that we are bending the curve on the speed of research, and we're making investments in manufacturing capacity before we know the efficacy and safety of drugs. I think to, to one other question there, to, to, for politicians to play a role, they should be explaining this, that, that decisions make on drugs is not validating that we know whether they're efficacious or safe yet. We're putting everything in place and investing a lot of money to get as much of that to Americans as possible, but that when it comes to real science and the way science works and falsifiability and all of those other dimensions, um, that, that no shortcut uh, was taken. And I think that's why Pfizer uh, stood up along with others and made the strong uh, declaration that they did because they have a sense that Americans right now are out there not trusting the ecosystem and not trusting 
uh, the science. So I'll leave it there that yes, we are in, in times, this is why I made the point about Galileo, is we can both be on the edge of an incredible, miraculous, historic race to vaccines that has never been matched. And at the same time, Galileo could be found guilty again. Both of those are happening at the same time. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. Really appreciate your thoughts. Uh, I'm sure everyone found them very enlightening. I know I sure did. Uh, people can uh, read your uh, editor at large at the Hill. Uh, so I hope people will read your work there, uh, among other places. Seems like you're many places these days. You mentioned being on TV as well. Uh, so thank you, Steve. Uh, folks, as a reminder, you can see what people are saying on Twitter using the hashtag RA Forum and through the chat feature on Zoom. I now want to introduce a series of short videos from leaders across the science and research spectrum. We're calling these videos 231, 20 voices, three minutes, one question. Donna mentioned this feature previously. We've invited a diverse set of individuals to each answer one question in three minutes flat, shown through the three days. I admit there are a few more than 20 voices that you're going to hear. And even so, I, I know that we wish we had time to include many, many more. I think you'll find these videos extremely compelling. Our first two segments th that you will see now feature first Donna Cryer from the Global Liver Institute and David Reese from Amgen, whose insights form the perfect platform for our opening panel discussion. Okay, we'll hear from Donna first. Increasing the trust that everyone in our society has in science is such an important endeavor. And so I'd like to uh, have us think about um, the three R's or three components that would go into increasing that trust. And not the, the three R's that we're, we're used to, but perhaps three new ones. And those are uh, relatability, reliability, and relationship. First of all, um, science has to be relatable for people to have trust in it, to care about it. Um, it has to be relevant to everyone's lives. And normally we talk about that in the context of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics or STEM education for children. And as the daughter of school teachers, I certainly believe in that. Um, but even for children, we need to make sure that our science education is hands-on, is uh, part of their experience, is uh, they have exposure to those who are engaged actively in science and in research. Also, that education shouldn't just stop with children, but needs to go out through our entire lives. Everyone is touched by science every day. And so as science uh, is a it's such a major component of our food, our medicines, even our hair and makeup. There's something in science for everyone. So science should be relatable and relevant. The second component is that um, science should have a high degree of reliability. Now, often we talk about you know, p-values and things uh, in terms of that reliability, but in the instance of creating trust, there needs to be a consistent integrity and honesty to the conducting of science and the messaging around it. And I think a key component of that will involve um, being more inclusive in science, admitting that mistakes have been made in the past and involving people who have been excluded or exploited by science in the past. Um, in the process of developing, planning, executing and communicating our science today and moving forward. It's also important for everybody to understand that science evolves. That's uh, a feature, not a bug. Um, but people really need to understand that if they're going to rely on science and have an engagement with it. Finally, uh, people need to be in relationship with science. And that needs to be a collaborative endeavor that everyone um, is engaged with and everyone from every community has a, a stake in. And I think together we can increase the trust that our society has in science. It's so important to us all. I was initially inspired to pursue a career in medicine and science by reading a big fat book by Charles Darwin called The Origin of Species. 
holed up in my bedroom in the country outside a tiny little town in the Midwest. At age 14, my understandings of, of these concepts wasn't very deep, of course, but I knew that somehow I had to be part of this grand enterprise. That was the epiphany. Fast forward. After studying evolutionary biology as an undergraduate and then training in internal medicine and oncology after medical school, I later had the great privilege to witness the birth of what we now call precision medicine. Precision medicine, with, which offers enormous potential in the struggle against human disease, is a natural outgrowth of the tremendous explosion of biologic knowledge we've accumulated in the last half century. Knowledge generated through a deep and abiding commitment to basic research, driven by curiosity and the desire to understand nature on a fundamental level. But we're just at the beginning of what will prove to be a transformative century in the quest to conquer human disease. I really believe this in my soul. In fact, the vistas opening before us are simply breathtaking. Think of it. We stand on the precipice of an era in which the convergence of a host of technologies will upend our drug discovery and development paradigm. Genetics, other omics, digital medicine, big data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, all converging and being used to understand the human organism and its diseases in new and fundamental ways. Through these technologies, we have the opportunity to develop far, far more effective treatments for bad diseases. Perhaps more importantly, we have the opportunity to predict who is likely to develop a disease and prevent it from happening. We can move from our current approach in medicine, a break it and fix it, to a predict and prevent paradigm. We can also more efficiently develop new treatments, allowing greater access to life-saving drugs around the globe. And it all starts with research. For all of these reasons, and in the real belief that it is our absolute obligation to light the way for those coming behind, I'm a research champion. I hope you are too. So impressive and so inspiring. You can watch these videos again in the 231 booth on this platform. Did you know that Research America's Alliance membership includes some 400 organizations from academia, independent research institutes, academic health centers, scientific societies, industry, patient advocacy organizations, and philanthropies. To learn more, visit the Research America booth. If you are already a member, we thank you and welcome your visit to the booth too, to say hello, as well as for any questions that you may have. So now we're going to take a five minute break, but don't go far. Please visit the exhibit booths for resources and research advocacy opportunities. We'll be back at 1150 East Coast time for our first panel, Securing a Science Strong Future. Thank you.